Good afternoon, Audrey. We're going through Beowulf. There are a few notes that I wanted to add to part one that we went over together. Um, so if you'll just look up at the sentence up here, I'm going to put, I just want to make sure everyone has the same notes. So you guys have your Beowulfs up. Okay, you guys had the paper copies, didn't you? All right, that's fine. Okay, so we kind of, just to reiterate some of the things that we went over with, with Beowulf, a couple of things I've added on to here for you. First of all, this poem was written between two to 300 AD by Christian, monk, by Christian monks. And again, the purpose, as we talked about before on Friday, the purpose was to proselytize or to bring Christianity into the Anglo-Saxons, right? We talked about that on Friday, I believe. <clears throat> and we talked about the digression, about the creation, how that was an opportunity for them to bring into the ideas, the creation story. And it digresses from the story of Beowulf, but it again, it's another opportunity for them to bring in the ideas of Christianity. You have right down here in lines 15 through 20, you have the parentage of Grendel. We talked about him being the spawn of Cain and that Cain parentage. Yeah, parentage is like parents. And we talked about how his parent was, he was a descendant of Cain who was the first murderer. And we talked about how his he kind of splintered off into all of these different um, demons and fiends. And they had been banished by God. Then there was another digression about Cain and Abel in the story about their death and what happened to all these people. And again, we didn't talk about this, but I think it's important. Um, on, we didn't talk about it on Friday, but basically they're giving a message here that if you are like Grendel or Cain or Abel, these are the consequences of your sin. You will be forever separated from God and you will not have, um, you will not be able to be in his presence. So shut away from men, they split into a thousand forms of evil, spirits and fiends, goblins, monsters, giants, a brood forever posing the Lord's will and again and again defeated. There's a message there, either repent and become a Christian or you'll never be a winner again. So again, it's another strong message to, that the monks are writing in there for the story of Froth, for the story of Frothgar and what's happening to him. Okay, we talked about Herat on Friday, and we said that Herat was the name of Frothgar's Nihal. Frothgar. Remember him? Uh, H R O T H G A R Hrothgar. His mead hall was Herat. And then uh, what Grendel did, what, do you remember why he came to the mead hall? What was what his problem was? He was the music was making him nuts, right? And the music was all about creation and God and all this sort of stuff. And of course, that went great on his nerves because he was evil. And yeah, so he wasn't there like Cain. Yep, that was back up here. And he's what has been the devil? Right. Okay. The first murderer was supposedly his parentage. Okay, so and then he comes up and he says there was silence. He snatched up 30 men. Well, that'd be pretty hard to do, right? So he's using hyperbole there. He's exaggerating Grendel's power and the effect of Grendel by saying he snatched up the 30 men and took them off and and uh, slaughtered them. He wept fearing the beginning might not be the end. That's okay, on line 37. Line 37 was the hyperbole. Okay, all right. Then uh, Her uh, Hrothgar, is sat joyless. He was mourning the fate of his friends and companions. He wept, beginning, fearing the beginning might not be the end. Grendel came again and again and again and again. 
So what did they do? They couldn't defeat him, so they decided to leave Herat. So they left and found other places to rest and other places to sleep because those that slept were murdered in their sleep by the monster Grendel. And as a result, we talked about the fact that it stayed empty for 12 years. So no one rejoiced, no one went to Herat and had a celebration in the Mead Hall for 12 years. 12 is a significant number. The numbers of 12 and seven are significant in Christianity. And so it's not surprising that they make it 12 years. All right, right in line 65, how Grindel's hatred began, how the monster relished his savage war on the Danes, keeping the bloody feud alive, seeking no peace, offering no truce, accepting no settlement, no price in gold or land, and paying the living for one crime only with another. So Grindel was obviously not interested in negotiating. There was nothing that, that Hrothgar could offer him that could keep him out of Herat. He was there and he wasn't gonna leave. But when the night hit him, he never dared to touch King Hrothgar's glorious throne. Why not? It was protected by God, okay? But Hrothgar's heart was bent. So in other words, he wasn't, any, he wasn't on the straight and narrow any longer. It was bent away from God and bent away from Christianity because they sacrificed to the old stone gods, made heathen vows, hoping for hell's support, the devil's guidance in driving their affliction off. That was their way and the heathen's only hope. Hell always in their heart, knowing neither God nor his passing, okay? So they reverted out of desperation. They reverted to the old stone gods. They reverted to the ideas of paganism to try and get Grendel defeated and out of his hall, out of Herat. So the paganism starts rearing its head. And as a result, we're on lines 90 through 95 right now, you have another digression. And remember digressing is going away from the main point. So in lines 95 through 105, you have this digression and there is a warning for those that leave God's teaching. Sure, I'll leave that up there. We had most of it, but I wanted to go over some of the other stuff with you again. It's a good review. And sometimes they sacrifice to the old stone gods, um, knowing neither God nor his passing as he walks through our world, the Lord of heaven and earth. Their ears could not hear his praise nor know his glory. Let them beware, those who are thrust into danger, clutched at by trouble, yet can carry no solace in their hearts, cannot hope to be better. Hail to those who will rise to God, drop off their dead bodies, and seek our Father's peace. So you have a warning. You're not going to be able to have any peace in your hearts. You're never going to be able to be better. And then you have praise for those people who are allowed to, to who, who rise to God and seek the Father's peace. Again, Christianity, right? Okay. So... Living in sorrow of Healthdane's son. Who is Healthdane's son? By the way, that's a what. I'm not going to be able to write on this. I'm going to have to. I don't think it'll let me write. Is it like, like, like a, a thingy to compare to the name of a well-known? It's like when thing. you say blank, son of blank, and then I can't think of what that is. So It's an epithet. epithet. Oh, well, it's not going to let. I thought it was going to let me do this, but it's not going to. Mrs. Parker, what's that called though when you refer to a well-known uh, illusion? Yeah, it wouldn't be an illusion because yes, he is well known, but it's an epith it's an epithet because it's describing him again. 
So the living sorrow, bitter, fresh, and who would hear about it except for Beowulf? So you've got your epithet up here. Mm -hmm. And then you have Beowulf, who is Higlak's follower. Higlak is one of the mm -hmm. uh, thanes of the Yates. Is that another one? Who? Another epithet? Yes, it is another epithet. I wish this was up mine. It just lets me put an E there. <laughs> it won't let me get any farther. So that's an epithet as well. Okay, then at the end of that, you had some creep of the pagan beliefs where the omens were good. And we figured out there were 14 people in all that were going to go on this quest to defeat Brindle. Remember that? And that's kind of where we stopped on Friday. Okay. How are we doing? All right, so now we're going to go to the next part, which is the arrival of the hero. What's paganism? Belief, uh, it's belief in other things as spiritual rather than God. So the God, the Greek gods and, and goddesses would be pagans because they're not the one God. And belief, oh. animism would be a form of paganism. And animism was this worship of because every spirit's cults. the druids and the Celts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then Wolfgar went to the door and addressed the waiting seafarers with soldiers' words. My lord, the great king of the Danes, commands me to tell you that he knows of your noble birth and that having come to him from over the open sea, you have come bravely and are welcome. Now go to him as you are in your armor and helmets, but leave your battle shields here and your spears let them lie waiting for the promises your words may make okay so they welcome him with reservations right why what are their reservations okay but what why do you think they said Why do you think they said, come on in in your armor, but leave your weapons at the door? Because they want to attack them. Or they're afraid, right? Reservations. They're afraid. Here you, here you have this great warrior coming armed into your safe place. And if he's such a great warrior, then how is it how are you going to keep him from, if he has any mischief in his heart, how are you going to keep him under control? Well, you make him leave his weapons outside, right? You can, you can wear your armor, which is the concession to saying, we understand that you feel vulnerable, that you might be worried about us, but you can wear your armor for protection, but don't bring your weapons in the house, okay? Let them lie laying for the prompt, waiting for the promises you make your words and again this is going to be terrible because i don't get my smart board here okay beowulf arose with his men around him ordering a few to remain with their weapons leading the others quickly along Herod's steep roof into frothgar's presence standing on that prince's own hearth helmeted the silvery metal of his mail shirt gleaming with a smith's high art he greeted the great dane's great lord what does that description do Thank you. Okay, it helps you build this image of this powerful warrior that's outfitted in this fantastic armor, right? Okay, hail Hrothgar. Now look at what he says here. Piglack is my cousin and my king. The days of my youth have been filled with glory. Now Grindel's name has echoed in our land. Sailors have brought us stories of Hera, the best of all mead halls, deserted and useless when the moon hangs in the skies, the sun had lit, light and life fleeing together. My people have said, the wisest, most knowing, and best of them, we did this, didn't we? My duty is to go to the Danes, great king. They have seen my strength for themselves, have watched me rise from the darkness of war, dripping with my enemy's blood. 
I drove five great giants into chains, chased all of that race from the earth. I swam in the blackness of night, hunting monsters out of the ocean and killing them one by one. Death was my errand and the fate they had earned. Now Brindle and I are called together and I've come. Grant me then, Lord and protector of this noble place, a single request. Okay, look at what he says here. Sounds like he's bragging, right? But what is he doing? No, because he's there for to help them, not to make them short. That he's like fearless type of thing. And that that is worthy. For this them. is his resume. You want to know if I've been successful before? I've been successful. These are the things that I've done. I've killed this. I've done this. I've wrote, I've vanquished my enemies. I'm your guy. So this is like Beowulf giving his re his resume. And again, if I write on stuff, it's going to disappear really quickly because I can't keep it up there. But it doesn't type either. No. Nope. So this is his resume. This is telling them that he is capable. He is the person that they want. This isn't Cammy. Otherwise, I could. I but Cammy isn't on my computer. So can you just start that? Is it from where you put it at 150 where that part starts, or is it all the way up to the top? Um, I have to go and look. Because there's the part where it says that he says his okay. class, whatever is his cousin. Right. You that's part of his heritage, right? Introducing his heritage. But this part right here is basically his resume where it tells what have I done? I have they've seen my strength, they've watched me rise, they were dripping with my enemy's blood. I drove them into chains, I chased the giants out, I swam hunting monsters, killing them all. I they'd earned death and I gave it to them. And now Grindel is come into my hearing. And we're called together and I've come. Grant me then one single request. So you have one request. That's all he has. That's what I would, would highlight. And I'm going to put this up here so that I can have more room to write. A single request. That's all that Beowulf wants. I have come so far, oh, shelterer of warriors and your people's loved friends. What is that? An epithet, right? Because that's an epithet about Hrothgar. That this one favor you should not refuse me, that I alone and with the help of my men may purge evil from this hall. So what's his request? What's he want? Right, by themselves. I don't want your help. I'm going to do this alone. Okay, so he tells Hrothgar, me and my men will be in this building. My men and I will be in this building. We are the ones that are going to take care of Grendel. That's all I ask is that you let me handle it. I have heard too that the monster's scorn of men is so great that he needs no weapons and fears none. Nor will I. So what is he saying? I won't use any weapons to kill him. That he sounds pretty sure of himself, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay. My Lord Higlack, and who is Higlack? No, it was, it was a Yate. It was one of, it was the Beowulf's liege lord, okay? My lord Hicklack might think less of me if I let my sword go where my feet were afraid to, if I hid behind some broad linden shield. My hands alone will fight for me. So how's he plan on defeating Grindel? Where does Burr hands, okay? Struggle for life against the monster. God must decide who will be given to death's cold grip. So who is the final decision of the winner left to? God, okay? 
So God must decide who will be given into death's gold grip. I'm going to fight him with my bare hands, with no armor, with no shield, with no sword, and God will determine who the winner, who the winner is. Okay? May I erase this? Anybody need any more of that? Okay. God will decide who will be given into death's cold grip. Grendel's plan, I think, will be what has been before, to invade this hall and gorge his belly with our bodies. If he can, if he can. And I think, if my time will have come, there'll be nothing to mourn over, no corpse to prepare for its grave. Grendel will carry our bloody flesh to the moors, crunch on our bones, and smear torn scraps of our skin on the walls of his den. So, does he know what he's getting into? Oh yeah, he has no romantic ideas about this at all. No, I expect no Danes will fret about sewing our shrouds if he wins. And if death does take me, send the hammered mail of my armor to Higlet. Return the inheritance I had from Hrethril and he from Wayland. Fate will unwind as it must. Okay, so you have here, he's not going to be wearing his armor, right? So it won't be on his body for Grendel to take. And then you have this creeping in of fate unwinding as it will, which is a nod to the old pagan ways. Because Christians don't believe in fate, right? They believe in the will of God, God's will. Uh-oh, well, but it'll be whatever is fated. Okay, so it's, it's a little different there. Hrothgar replied, protector of the Danes, Beowulf, you've come to us in friendship and because of the reception, your father founded our court. F Enspo had begun a bitter feud, killing Hathlap, a wolfling warrior. Your father's countrymen were afraid of war. If he returned to his home and they turned him away, then he traveled across the curving ways to the lands of the Danes. I was new to the throne, then a young man ruling this wide kingdom in its golden city. Hergar, my older brother, a far better man than I, had died, and dying made me second among Health Dane's sons, first in this nation. So they've got some history here. How did Hrothgar know Beowulf? Whom did he have a relationship with? No. Here's Beowulf's dad, Edsfield. He had begun a through feud by killing this person. And rather than going to war, what had he done? Oh, travel. He went from the land of Sweden to the land of the Danes, where he met. No. Hrothgar. Okay. Hergar so was dead. <coughs> Too many H's. Yeah. Hergar that's... was dead, and Hrothgar had just become king. Oh, so right when he became king, that's when he. Okay. Got right. It. I thought he knew him before he went back. Never mind. I bought the end of Edstheo's quarrel, sent ancient treasures through the ocean's furrows to the wolflings. Wolfings. Your father swore he'd keep that peace. So basically, what had Hrothgar done for Beowulf's father? He, bribed, did he, technically bribe the he paid his blood debt. Oh. Okay? He paid his blood debt. He sent treasure to pay for the death of the wolf, wolfling's man. My tongue grows heavy, and in my heart, I will try and tell you what Grindel has bought us, the damage he's done here in this hall. You see for yourself how much smaller our ranks have become and can guess what we've lost to his terror. Surely the Lord Almighty could stop this madness, smother his lust. How many times have my men 
glowing with courage, drawn from too many cups of ale, sworn to stay after dark and stem that horror with a sweep of their swords. And then in the morning, this need hall glittering with new light would be drenched with blood. The benches stained red, the floors all wet from that fiend savage assault. And my soldiers would be fewer still, death taking more and more. But to table, Beowulf, a banquet in your honor. Let us toast your victories and talk of the future. Then Hrothgar's men gave place to the gates, yielded benches to the grave visitors, and led them to the feast. The keeper of the mead came carrying the carved flask and poured that bright sweetness. A poet sang from time to time in a clear, pure voice, Danes and visiting Yates celebrated as one, drank and rejoiced. Okay, so where are we trying to get a little bit 15? Okay, we're doing well. All right. Now up steps Ufirth or Unfirth. Unfirth, who sat at Halfgar's feet, spoke harshly and sharp, vexed by Beowulf's adventure, by their visitor's courage, and angry that anyone in Denmark or anywhere on the earth had ever acquired glory and fame greater than his own. Somebody tell him. Yes. So Beowulf has a person that is not his fan, and his name is Unferth. Okay? All right. No, he's jealous of Beowulf and the power that he has and his resume. Okay? You're Beowulf, are you? The same boastful fool who fought a swimming match with Brecca? <clears throat> Both of you daring and young and proud, exploring the deepest seas, risking your lives for no reason but the danger? All older and wiser heads warned you not to, but no one could check such pride. With Brecca by your side, you swam along the sea paths, your swift moving hands pulling you over the ocean's face. Then winter churned through the water and the waves ran you as they willed and you struggled seven long nights to survive. At the end of that, victory was his, not yours. The sea carried him close to his home, to Southern Norway, near the land of the Brondings, where he ruled and was loved, where his treasure was piled and his strength protected his town and his people. He promised to outswim you. Bonstan's son made that boast ring true. So Brecca is the son of Bonstan. You've been lucky in your battles, Beowulf, but I think your luck may change if you challenge Grindel, staying a whole night through in this hall, waiting for that fierce of demons can find you. Beowulf answered, edged those great son. Ha, Inferth, my Unferth, my friend. Your face is hot with ale, and your tongue has tried to tell us about Brecca's doings. Hmm. Doesn't sound like the, it sounds like the feeling is mutual. There's not much respect there. Basically, what did he call Unferth? A what? And a drunk. Oh, ale. You're a drunk, and you're lying. Okay. Dumb daughters, fighting words. Okay. <clears throat> But the truth is simple. No man swims in the sea as I can. No strength is a match for mine. As boys, Brecca and I had boasted, we were both too young to know better, that we'd risk our lives far out at sea, and so we did. Each of us carried a naked sword prepared for whales or swift, sharp teeth and beaks of needlefish. He could never leave me behind, swim faster across the waves than I could, and I had chosen to remain close to his side. <clears throat> I remained near him for five long nights until a flood swept us apart. The frozen sea surged around me. It grew dark. The wind turned bitter, blowing from the north, and the waves were savage. Creatures who sleep deep in the sea were stirred into life, and the iron hammered links of my mail shirt, these shining bits of my metal woven across my breast, saved me from death. A monster seized me drew me swiftly toward the bottom, swimming with its claws tight in my flesh. But fate, so we're back to the heathen gods, right? 
But fate let me find its heart with my sword, hack myself free. I fought that beast last by battle, left it floating lifeless in the sea. So even though Beowulf is saying God can decide who's going to be the winner, and the priest had an opportunity here and said, but God protected me. Instead, Beowulf says, oops, fate. Uh-oh, <laughs> forgot, sorry, okay. <laughs> Other monsters crowded around me, continually attacking. I treated them politely, offering the edge of my razor-sharp sword. But the feast, I think, did not please them. What feast is he referring to? Himself. His razor-sharp sword. <laughs> I offered them the sword, but they weren't too happy about that. Imagine that. Filled their evil bellies with no banquet-rich food, thrashing there at the bottom of the sea. By morning, they decided to sleep on the shore, lying on their backs. Their blood spilled out on the sand. So did they really decide to sleep on the shore? What is he basically saying? He killed them, okay? Afterwards, sailors could cross that sea road and feel no fear. Nothing would stop their passing. So not only did he kill the sea monsters, but what else did he do? He killed the sea monsters and serendipitously, what happened? He created a safe passage. Great! Not only did I kill the sea monsters, but now everybody can travel safely because of me. Hubris. Okay? Nothing would stop their passing. Then God's bright beacon appeared in the east, which is... What is God's bright beacon? The sun. The water lay still, and at last I could see the land. Wind swept cliff walls at the edge of the coast. Fate saves the living when they drive away death by themselves. Again, slipping back into paganism, right? Lucky or not, nine was the number of sea huge monsters I killed. What man anywhere under heaven's high arch has fought such darkness endured more misery or been harder pressed. Yet, I survived the sea, smashed the monster's heart jaws, swam home from my journey. So here you have an example. I don't know if it'll let me do it, but I'll try. You have an example here of his hubris, right? It kind of goes to here. It won't let me. That's just weird. I've heard no tales of you, Unfurt. <laughs> I've heard no tales of you, Unfurt, telling of such clashing tears, such contests in the night. Brecca's battles were never so bold. Neither he nor you can match me. And I mean no boast. You sure about that, Beowulf? have announced no more than I know to be true. And there's more. You murdered your brothers. You, your own close kin. Words and bright wit won't help your soul. You'll suffer hell's fires, Unferth, forever tormented. So not only does he call him a liar, he also calls him a murderer and exposes his plan, okay? It laughs, plowed son, if your hands were as hard, your heart as fierce as you think it, no fool would dare to raid your hall, ruin Herat, and oppress its prince as Grindel has done. But he's learned that terror is his alone, discovered he can come from your people with no fear of reprisal. He's found no fighting here, only food, only delight, he murders as he likes, with no mercy, gorges and feasts on your flesh and expects no trouble, no quarrel from the quiet Danes. So basically, what is he told him? Yeah, if Grindel felt like he had anything to fear, he would not have his way here. But he has nothing to fear from you. Okay? Yep, that guy, he doesn't back down, does he? Now the Yates will show him courage. Soon he can test his strength in battle. And when the sun comes up again, opening another bright day from the south, anyone in Denmark may enter this hall. 
that evil will be gone. Okay, so challenge accepted, right? And he's basically telling him that if Grendel had felt that there was a threat because you were a great warrior, then we wouldn't have this problem. But you have no courage. Hrothgar, gray-haired and brave, sat happily listening, the famous ring giver sure at last that Grendel could be killed. He believed in Beowulf's bold strength and the firmness of his spirit. There was the sound of laughter and the cheerful clanking of cups and pleasant words. Then Welfowl, Hrothgar's gold-ringed queen, greeted the warriors, a noble woman who knew what was right. She raised a flowing cup to Hrothgar first, hold, holding it high for the Lord of the Danes to drink, wishing him joy in that feast. The famous king drank with pleasure and blessed their banquet. Then Walfall went from warrior to warrior. I'm sure I'm absolutely slaughtering the pronunciation of these Danish names, so please bear with me. Pouring a portion from the jeweled cup for each until the bracelet wearing queen had carried the mead cup among them and it was Beowulf's turn to be served. What's an epithet in that sentence? Line 353 to 356. Bracelet wearing. Yep, bracelet wearing. She saluted the Yates great prince. Thank God for answering her prayers, for allowing her hands the happy duty of offering mead to a hero who would help her afflicted people. He drank what she poured, edged Tho's brave son, then assured the Danish queen that his heart was firm, his hands ready. When we crossed the sea, my comrades and I already knew my purpose was this, to win the goodwill of your people or die in battle, pressed in Grendel's fierce grip. Let me live in greatness and courage, or here in this hall, welcome my death. Welcome was so pleased with his words, his bright tongue boasts, she carried them back to her lord, walked nobly to his side. The feast went on, laughter and music, and the brave words of warriors celebrating their delight. Then Hrothgar rose, Helfdane's son, heavy with sleep. As soon as the sun had gone, he knew that Grendel would come to Herat, would visit that hall when night had covered the earth with its net. And the shapes of the darkness moved back and silent through the world. Hrothgar's warriors rose with him. He went to Beowulf, embraced the Yates' brave prince, wished him well, and hoped that Herod would be his to command. And then he declared, No one strange to this land has been granted what I have given you. No one in all the years of my rule. Make this best of all mead hall yours. Then keep it free from evil. Fight with glory in your heart. Purge Herat, and your ship will sail home with its treasure holds filled. So what does Hrothgar give to him? Yeah, remember Sutton Who? <laughs> so he's saying that if you fight for me and you defeat Grendel, you will go home a rich man. Okay, we're going to stop there. How's that sound? Everybody okay? You know what's going on? Feel like you're doing okay? AJ, I can't see you, but are you doing okay? Type something. Yup, okay. <laughs> All right, AJ, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Okay, there are no other questions then? You do have some questions.